many times that we as humans, we forget a lot of things, correct? We, we forget where our keys are at and when they're in your pocket. Uh, you forget where your glasses are when they're on top of your head. My grandparents are here. I'm sure they have a lot of those moments. <laughs> but we, we, we all have... We all have a, a, a human mind that forgets a lot of things. I can tell you straight up, I don't know anything from high school. I'm just being straight. Like, I, I remembered a few things, but a lot of things I don't remember. I, I was in math classes. I don't remember the formulas. I don't remember the reco- equations because I didn't keep them in my memory. I didn't stay every single day and uh, X plus Y equals this and that and that. I didn't do that because that's something that I didn't really want to do. And the same exact thing applies to the word of God and to your faith. If you don't keep in remembrance, you are prone to forget. Uh, And and another thing about being thankfulness, and we'll move on to the next one, is you cannot thank God. You not, you can't, you shouldn't thank God after you cross the Red Sea. Amen. You need to thank God before crossing the Red Sea. If you see in Exodus, right before they crossed the Red Sea, they had no idea how they were going to cross. They had no idea how they were going to do anything. And Moses led the people to remember everything God has done. Everything. And once he did that, God told Moses to take up your staff, put it in the air, and the seas split. And because Moses led his people to remembrance, and they led him to remember what God has done for them. So don't wait on the other side until you're on the other side to be thankful. Start thanking God before. Start thanking God when you can't see it. When you can't see that it's going to end up good, continue to thank God. And I promise you, I promise you, you'll be better for it. So the, the, the first one was, was to glorify God. To stay full of God, you need to glorify God. The second one is to be thankful. And number three is to use your imagination. Paul said that neither were they thankful and they became vain in their imagination. So what does that mean? Uh, sometimes people think that that means that their imagination stops working. And that's not it at all. Or, or your imagination, it always works, no matter what. Uh, but it either works for you or it works against you. If it works for you, then you're in good hands because then you can imagine good things. You can imagine um, Things that you can imagine what the Word of God says by you, by picturing that um, you that you'll be prosperous, picturing that you'll your family is going to reach salvation. But when you have a vain imagin- imagination, it just means that your imagination is working against you now. It's not working for you. Uh, the minute the doctor tells you something, if they say, "Oh, you have a life-threatening disease," the minute your imagination goes, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to die," or "I'm going to start planning my funeral already." That is the indicator that your imagination has gone vain and it's working against you. So, imagination is extremely powerful. It's it's so powerful that in Genesis that that God, when when he had his people, they were building the Tower of Babel. They were were climbing these, building these things and making it super high. And God said, he said, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God, God said that. He said that nothing that they have imagined to do will be restrained. That's how powerful your imagination is. And you might be thinking, well, that's just dreaming. That's just uh, hoping and just like dreaming for something cool. And imagination is not real. It's fantasy. Well, it is fantasy. That's how Disneyland is alive right now. It's all purely fantasy and, and money. But your imagination, it is used to see the future, to see yourself prosperous and it is so powerful that God even said that they, they are imagining something that will never be restrained because of their imagination. That's how powerful your imagination is. Uh, it, it, it's even, um, or we're called that our spiritual weapons that we have in us, the spiritual weapons, they are there so that we can cast down every imagination. So imaginations are more powerful than you think. It's not just a fantasy but it's what you believe. It's your mind. It's how you think. It's how you picture things. Um, and we all have an imagination. It's not that once you, you, you don't stop using your imagination at one age. Um, if I had you guys all close your eyes right now, in fact, everyone close your eyes right now. We're going to practice this. We're going to do a little illustration for you. So everyone close your eyes and just think of nothing. Just blank. Guarantee you can't think of nothing. Maybe my, my fiance because she does that sometimes. But... I want you now to picture a wheel. 
Now, some might be picturing a tire with a, a car wheel. Some might be picturing a steering wheel, a wagon wheel. Now, I want you to think of, of, a, of a mid SUV, a mid-sized SUV in your mind. So now the wheel is now part of this car. So now you're picturing this car. Now you're picturing this thing in your imagination. So everyone, you can open your eyes now. Everyone has an imagination that they're working with. Some are working for them and some are working against them. So you need to figure out what is it? Is my imagination working for or against? Now, the, now I'll give you a definition. The definition of imagination is the act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in reality. The power of forming a mental image of something not present. It's your imagination. Now, I'm going to take you to another scripture. This will be back in Romans chapter 8. This is the exact definition of an imagination. So Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 25. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So hope is... You need to hope for things that aren't seen. Faith, the definition of faith in Hebrews, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, what, so if you look at the definition of, of imagination, it's, it's forming a mental image of something not present. If you look at the biblical definition, hope is something that we see not. We hope for something we see not. So that brings to the conclusion that hope is a positive imagination. Because all of the other scriptures that referenced imagination was tearing them down, and God had to give them a new language so that they wouldn't build the Tower of Babel, so their imagination was so strong, so he had to stop that. And so all the time it's, it's referenced in scripture with imagination, it's all negative. It's all casting down and, 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 and tearing down. But in this instance, the word hope, it seems like it's the exact same word as imagination, but positive. So hope is a positive imagination in Scripture. And in 1 Corinthians, it actually says now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And it says the greatest is love. But hope is one of the greatest three things that the Scriptures ever mention. It's one of the greatest. So you can't have faith Without any hope, that's what Hebrews was saying, that with faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't have any faith without hope. You need hope. But you can't please God without faith. So you need to have hope. You need to have a positive imagination. I'm sure you guys have heard the verse, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in him. His mind Will, is stayed on thee, and he is perfect. He's in perfect peace. The word mind was translated imagination in that scripture, and it was literally translated conception. And when, when you imagine things, you're conceiving things in your mind. It's, your, it's a spiritual womb that your mind is. So when you, when you conceive something, something starts to develop, and in a natural term, when you conceive a child, the child starts to develop in your stomach, and once you're done in the womb, and once it's out, it's a full human. It's a full thing that started at conception. And the mind works just like that. If you plant things in your mind that are negative, what's going to produce is negative thoughts. It's going to produce negative outcomes in your life because you've conceived wrong things in your mind. So how do we keep our minds on the Lord? And it's the exact opposite of what I was just saying. You have to allow the Holy Spirit now to plant seeds in your mind. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to, to conceive. You need to conceive things from the Holy Spirit in your mind so that you can start imagining things, that you can start uh, picturing things that aren't possible. You can start dreaming big and believing in things that aren't possible. And like I mentioned earlier, me and my, my lovely fiance, Stephanie, we um, have our, our ministry. And it's, right now, it's literally just a Bible study. We have a website. Uh, we try to post videos online um, of, of messages and stuff. And it's simply 
small right now. It's only a few people that show up and um, a few people that watch our videos. But God has told me certain things. And um, within this past week, and I was sharing with her that I've been wondering, God, why, why, is, why is it so small? Like, You've, you've planted this in my heart a long time ago. And a long time ago, he gave me this vision of deep-rooted and what it was. And um, a few years have passed, and now it's actually developing, and it's actually a thing. And I asked, Lord, why is it so small? If you've, if you've gave me this, why is it small? And he told me um, a few weeks ago, he said, because you're in the watering season. The seed's been planted in my mind and in reality, that's been planted. But now we're just in this stage of watering. Now we're in this stage of nourishing and making sure it grows to its full potential. But we have to start at the beginning. And then I asked him again, okay, Lord, that, that's great. Cool. I'm assured. I know that it's, it's fine. And then I asked him, well, give me visions. Let me see these things. Uh, let me see what you have for us. And um, as I was driving to her house, the Lord told me very clearly, and I wrote it down when I was driving. I don't encourage you to do that. <laughs> but I wrote it down as I was driving, and the Lord told me that we are limiting God, not just by our thinking, but in our natural state. We're engaged. We're not married yet. And the Lord told me, when you become married, then I'll show you. And we're getting married this year in October, so it's all fine. But he told me, he said, when you get married, then I'll show you. And that just struck something in me because I, I can imagine things. I can imagine all these things. Like I have a great imagination. I can dream and I'll do all this stuff. But when it's led by the Lord, when it's led by God, I can't even, I can't imagine where it's going to be at. And it's, it's just so amazing how the Lord works through all that stuff. And I've been limiting him with our thinking and I've been limiting him with our status. And when we become married, then he's going to show us what we're supposed to be doing and what deep-rooted actually is going to look like in the future. So I encourage you to stay plugged in with us and um, stay connected, and it's going to be an awesome ride. Uh, we would love to have every single one of you there. It's on Monday nights, but it's so awesome, and I'm so excited. But um, when we become married, then he's going to give us visions, and then he's going to give us these things, and with those visions require imagination. So we need to make sure that our imaginations are not vain, that our imagination is pure, and our imagination is working for us. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel, um, David, he had, if we're going to go back to David, he had this amazing imagination. And it actually, he was able to imagine what was going to happen. And when he was with Goliath, after he esteemed God, after he rendered God glorious, he looked at Goliath and he told him, that I'm going to cut off your head, and we'll be victorious. We're going to win. I'm going to cut your head off. And if you remember, David only had five smooth stones. Five. And there's awesome lessons in this uh, that, one, he picked out five smooth stones. Do you know why he picked out five? He picked out five stones because Goliath, and this is true. You can look it up for yourself if you don't believe me. This is true. Goliath had three sons. And then one brother. That's five. Goliath, three sons, one brother. So not only did David think that he was going to defeat Goliath, but he had five stones, not just in case he missed, but just in case the other five showed up. He was going to slay all of them with one stone. But the other thing about that is that when he told Goliath, I will cut your head off, he only had five stones. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have an axe. He didn't have a chainsaw, anything that would cut off a head. But instead, what he did is he got his slingshot. He threw it at the giant, hit him in the head. He fell down, and it says that he picked up Goliath's sword, and he chopped off his head, and he hung it up and celebrated as a trophy. But he picked up Goliath's head. He chopped it off because he imagined it. He imagined himself doing that. And you, if you can't imagine yourself doing something, it's not going to happen. If you can't see it, it's not going to happen. I know that sounds hard, but it's true. And that's why I'm preaching this today, because if you can't see it, it's not going to happen. Which means you need to learn how to change your imagination, how to get yourself hope, how to have a positive imagination. Uh, in, in, in Genesis, we have Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham. If you want to turn with me to Genesis, we're almost done, I promise. <laughs> I know I'm getting hungry, so... 
uh, in Genesis chapter 13, if you guys want to turn there with me, verse 14 through 15. So it says this, chapter 13, 14. It says, and the Lord said to Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. So backstory, Abram and Lot, they had a little family feud. Lots of things, lots of people, and Abram's people weren't getting together as strife there. And so once they were separated, then the Lord spoke to Abram. Isn't it crazy how once strife is gone, God is there? Like there, there's, there's room for you to hear God once strife is gone. Anyways, uh, it says Lot was separated from him. He said this to Abram, lift up now thine eyes. And look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, to thee I will give it, and thy seed forever. Now who knows, we're, we're Abraham's seed, correct? We're part of Abraham's seed that God promised him. But if Abraham only saw the east, north, south, and west, who knows, that's very limited. It's very limited. He only can see so far. You can't see past, I don't even know what the, what the stats or what that fact is, but you can't see past a certain length. After that, it's just the curvature of the, of the world. But, so if he only was stuck to his natural seeing, then all of us would be crammed in one little area that Abraham saw. So it has to mean that Abraham used his imagination to see past what he could naturally see. And because of that, we are here today. We are here because Abraham, he looked past what he could see in the natural. He imagined what God promised him. <clears throat> in Hebrews, he did it again. Uh, it says that as they were leaving, it says that this is the hall of fame with uh, Abraham in it. And he said that they were not mindful from the land which they came from. And that's how they were able to to walk into what God has called them to do because they weren't mindful of the past. They weren't mindful of their old land, of their old things, the former things, but what God has promised them. So I ask you, what are some things in your life that, that, are, that are old? The Bible says that the old has passed the, and behold, all things have become new or new creatures. So what are some things in your life that are old mentality, that are old man, that are stuck in your mind because they're just, that's how you're, you're, you learn how to do life. What are some things that are old that you, that are tempting you to go back to? What are some of those things? And you don't have to answer, but just think about it. What are some of those things? Are you, are you giving them thought? Are you considering them? Are you allowing the opportunity for you to go back to them? Are you allowing that? And it says that in, in Hebrews, it says that they didn't allow the opportunity because they gave no thought to where they came from. So is your imagination working for you or working against you? And you, you need to dream big because God wants to take you places that you can't go by yourself, that you can't go with your own imagination. You have to use God's imagination and what God says for you. But what are you dreaming of? What do you want to do? What are you, what are you doing with your life? And what do you, where do you see yourself with your life? Do you want to start a business? Do you want to start a ministry? Do you want to be a pastor? Do you want to, um, what do you want to do? What is it? And if, if it's something that God wants you to do, then dream. Dream big. Dream big. That's the one thing that limits us is our imagination. And if we limit God with your imagination, if you can't see yourself doing it, you won't do it. You know, many times we want to we wanna stay in the comfort of our home, stay in the comfort of our friends, stay in the comfort of our family, uh, and we want to be comfortable. We want to hug the tree, the big trunk of the tree, but God wants to take us to the limbs. He wants to take us out on a limb because that's where the fruit grows. He takes us on the branches, and it's a little shaky. It's a little rough. When the wind comes, we'll shake We'll do all these things. But the limb, when you go out on a limb, that's where the fruit grows, not the trunk. So God wants you to take you somewhere, but your thinking needs to change. So the first one was to glorify God. Second one was to be thankful. Third one, use your imagination. And the last one, to illuminate your heart. To illuminate your heart. The last thing that Paul says was their foolish hearts were darkened. What does that mean? 
In Proverbs 23, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the exact same direction that your heart is going. I know some of you might be thinking, well, Matt, I didn't pray for sickness. Matt, I didn't think about being ill. I didn't think about being in poverty. I didn't think about all this stuff that's happening in my life to happen. I didn't think about getting laid off at my job. So how can you say that? You might not have thought it. You, not, you might not have sought it out and said, I'm going to get sick or I'm going to get fired. But you didn't resist it. Your heart wasn't in a position to resist it. Your heart was in a position to embrace it. And, and sometimes we get in this thinking of, well, you know, cancer, man, it's, it's inevitable. You can't stop it. It's incurable. And with that mentality, you are now, you're accepting it. You are allowing it to, to, be, to be. And that's not what we have to do. And we live as, as if we have no control over anything, over the flu, seasonal, you have to get the flu once a year, seasonal allergies, um, poor eyesight as you get older. There are things that we as a society, as people, have just embraced because the world has told us to. Doctors have told us, oh, when you're about this age, this is going to happen to you, so just get ready now. And those aren't things that you need to value and esteem. You need to disesteem what the world says and value what the word of God says. So we have the fullness of God in you. We have the ability to walk as Jesus walked. That says in 1 John 4, 17, it says, as he is in this, or as he is, so are you in this world. In this world. As Jesus Christ is, so are we in this world. And if you don't believe that, then your heart is in a position toward being darkened. Because you don't, you don't fully accept that. If you fully accept that, then you would be overcoming things. You would be overcoming certain situations and certain family, family uh, crises and all these things. You wouldn't be brought down to the very bottom. You wouldn't sink to the bottom because you'll be stirred up by the word of God and by faith. And you won't allow these things to overcome you. Jesus said that, that you will have troubles and tribulation in this world, but I have overcome the world. So take heart. If you are abiding in Jesus Christ, you have overcome the world. If you are part of Jesus Christ, if you are part of him, you have overcome it with him. He died for everything, not just certain things. When cancer comes, God doesn't just say, oh, it's too hard for me. Sorry. That's not how God works. Everything. God has literally, he destroyed everything. Every curse that was under the Old Testament law, and that's every sickness, everything, even things that are brand new today that just haven't appeared that people are naming. He's overcome everything. But your heart becomes darkened when you don't know what the Word of God says, when you start to value what the world says compared to what God and the Word of God has to say. And when you don't know the Word of God, you don't receive revelation from the Word. And revelation is simply, it, it's when the lights turn on. It's when the lights, boop, they click. They, 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 um, you see something. The word revelation is it's something's revealed to you. Something was revealed that's already been there. It's been there, but you just haven't seen it. But you can't have a revelation without an imagination. If you don't have an imagination, if, you don't, if your imagination isn't working for you, you can't see the revelation because your imagination, it's not, it's working against you. Does that make sense? So when you no longer see revelations, your, your heart is darkened and, and the light switch that illuminates it, it gets turned off and it becomes dark and that's how your heart is darkened. So, so how do you reverse that? It's, it's simple. You just got to change your imagination. You got to change the way you're thinking. You got to start glorifying God. Glorify God for how good he is. Glorify him for what the word is. If you have nothing to be thankful for in this life, praise God for what he's done in the word. Praise God for you're going to go to heaven. Praise God for something, for your salvation. If you have nothing to be thankful for, you still have the word of God to be thankful for your salvation in heaven. So praise him. Be thankful for him. 
And when you start to do those things, your imagination starts to work for you. You start to think on things pure. You start to stay in perfect peace because your mind's on him. And when that happens, your, 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 your heart is illuminated. You're starting to see these revelations that are in the word of God. And it's not a behavior modification. It's not a stop doing this and stop doing that and then you'll be okay. It's not a behavior modification. I'm against behavior modification because behavior modification deals on the outside. It deals on what you look like. Don't wear this to church. Don't wear that to church. Don't look like this. Don't have tattoos. Don't cut your hair. That's behavior modification because it's dealing on the outward, physical appearance, how you come off to people, how you look, how you talk. But God, he doesn't want to change the behavior. He wants to change your heart. And if your heart is darkened, he wants to change it. He wants to turn it around and he wants to lighten it. And so Matthew, if we want to turn to Matthew 23, Two more scriptures, you guys, I promise. <laughs> Matthew 23. I came across this as I was doing my, uh, preparing my sermon for this weekend. So Matthew 23, verse 25. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. G- Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Loving Jesus, hypocrites. Can you imagine that? It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Another translation says, dead man's bones. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that when the outside of them may be clean also. When you naturally start to change what's in here, what's in your heart, it naturally comes out of your outward appearance. If you just change the outside, you're just changing the way it looks. You're not changing anything else. You're not changing the condition of the heart or anything. You're just changing what they look like. But Jesus said, change the inside, clean the inside first, then the outside will be clean. It's the progressive chain of events. And if you, if you don't want to become, have your heart darkened, then you need to hear God's voice. You have to tune your hearing to God's voice. And uh, in, in John, there's a scripture that says that the shepherd leads the way and the sheep follow because they know his voice. And I, fa- I came across this t- this week and it was this is a revelation for you right here. If you don't have one, I'll give you one right now. It says this. It's in John 10, 4. That the sheep follow because they hear his voice. So I looked up. <clears throat> what does the code 10, 4 stand for? You ever heard that code before? Police officers, army people, the military 10, 4. They say 10, 4. Because it means affirmative, acknowledged, I'm obeying your order. John 10, 4 says that the sheep follow because they hear his voice. They hear what he says, 10, 4. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? I don't even know how that code got created, but I'm sure whoever did it was because of that scripture. And if anyone says otherwise, you're wrong. But... You have to hear his voice. You have to tune your hearing to God's voice. And just like radio waves and TV waves, if, if you turn back in the old day, if you turned like the channel and like did all that stuff, you, you turned to, free, to different frequencies and it, it would go to different TV shows and radio networks because you would tune it. And just like that, they're invisible. They're invisible waves that you're tuning. Your ears can tune to God's voice, to the word of God. In Proverbs it says, incline thine ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart, for they are life to those who find it and health to their bones. So tune your ears to God's voice. And our last scripture we're going to deal with today is in Mark chapter 6, verse 51. So Jesus was out praying. Uh, Right before he went to go pray, they just fed 5,000 people. It said 5,000 men not including women and children, who could have known there had been like 20,000 people there. 
But they just fed this amazing, this huge multitude, and he went out to pray. The disciples, he told them to go to the other side. Disciples went out on the other side. They cast their nets. They did all that stuff. And they went to the other side, and in the middle of it, there was a storm that broke out. And they were afraid. They were struggling, and Jesus saw them struggling. And it says in Mark that he saw them struggling, and he walked out to them. He walked out on the water, walking on the water. And he sees them, and, and they were so busy trying to not sink and all that stuff. They were esteeming the problem, not God. They were so busy trying to dump out all the water and, and not sink and not die. It says that he could have passed by. A man walking on the water, and he could have just passed on by because they were so distracted. But what happens is they see him, and it says immediately they were afraid. They thought it was a spirit or a ghost, and they cried out. <clears throat> And Jesus says, be of good cheer, as I do not be afraid. And he gets onto the boat, the wind and the wave, they seize. And right here in in verse 51, it says, And he went up to them into the ship, the wind seized, and they were so amazed in themselves, beyond measure, and they wondered. That sounds cool, huh? They were so amazed. But check this out. The next verse, 52. For they considered not... The miracle of the loaves, the feeding of the 5,000, for their heart was hardened. Hardened and darkened are the same concept. When you harden yourself, when your heart's hardened, you, 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 you're, you're not allowing the word to penetrate. You're not allowing it. You're, you're callousing it, and you're protecting it from the word of God so it's not getting in. And his own disciples, who just saw a miracle and many miracles before that, their hearts were still Hardened, and they didn't consider, they didn't even consider what just happened. They focused, they esteemed the problem over the miracle that just happened. And I guarantee you, if they would have esteemed God in this circumstance, in this situation, and if they would have remembered and said, you know, Jesus just fed 5,000 people, There's, he's going to come and save us. He's going to be here. This, the whole entire situation would have been different. But they were afraid because they did not remember and their heart was hardened. The consistency of life depends on how much you want it. How much you want to have a consistent life is how much you're going to get it. If you're not believing for it, if you can't imagine yourself having a consistent life, a a steady life, then you're probably not going to have it because your imagination is powerful. But if you honestly, if you want a life that is fearless, if you want a life that glorifies God, that is thankful, that is always imagining big, and that is you're, you're getting revelations, your heart is enlightened, then do these things. Glorify God. Give him thanks. Imagine big, and your heart will not be hardened. Again, Jesus said, these things I've spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But he commands us, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Another translation says, take heart. The word take, the the phrase take heart means to strengthen yourself. Be strong. And what we said earlier, when you praise God, You strengthen yourself. So praise God. You have the choice to magnify God or to magnify your problem. And a lot of times, a lot of people, a lot of Christians are magnifying their problem and they don't exalt God. And a lot of the time it's because they don't know, they don't truly know God's nature. They don't truly know what God can do. They believe God can heal, but they don't, believe they'll heal, 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 heal them. They know God is, can do miracles, but maybe not for them. They're not good enough. And they have this misconception of God. So there should be a difference between born-again believers and people who are lost. There should be a difference. And what I mean by this is um, Paul writes this in Ephesians. He says, therefore, I say to you, Testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Gentiles mean um, non-Jew lost people. In the van- don't walk as them in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, 
being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with great greediness. But you have not so learned that. If so be that you have heard Christ and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, you put off the concerning the former of the conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, in that you put on the new man, which is after God, and is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on the new man. Let the old man come off. What does the new man do? He glorifies God. He's thankful. He dreams big, and he has revelations. Put on that new man. And if you're anywhere today where you're struggling with that and you're, Matt, I don't know. How, life is just too hard. Life is just tearing me down. It's weighing me down. Worship band can come up right now too. If you're just at that point where just life is just too hard and life is just, ugh, man, it's crushing me. My son and daughter ran away. I haven't seen them in years. My children are lost. They don't know God. They don't have salvation. Doctor gave me a bad report. Man, I just don't know. Well, I'm telling you today, start magnifying God. That's the first step. Magnify God. Be thankful. And you'll find out that these are all, they all work together. They all work together. Magnify the Lord. Magnify how great God is. And you'll be thankful when you do that. And then the Lord is going to start revealing things to you. He's going to start doing things in your life that you didn't even know were possible. He's going to start taking you out on limbs because that's where the fruit grows. Live the life, the full life that God has for you. One of my good friends, I'm sure you might know her. She's ministered here before. Her name is Mary. She told me this one thing before, and uh, it really, really stuck with me. And she said, how come the devil's children get all of the good stuff, and then God's people get nothing? And the devil's children, uh, meaning in Ephesians, says that if you're of the world, The devil is the ruler of this world, so you're his children. That's what the Bible says. That's what she was referring to. Never will I ever go up to someone and say, you're a devil's child. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, why do the lost people get all of the money, the uh, prosperity, they, they look healthy, they have everything it looks like they want, but A lot of Christians are living in poverty, living in sickness, living in shame, guilt, all these things. We're not living victorious. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So whatever is bad is of him. God gives us life. And we don't understand that if you magnify God, if you glorify God, if you're thankful for God, your problems, everything in life, if you have an imagination, if you say, Matt, I can see myself prosperous. I can see God blessing us financially, blessing my family. If you can truly imagine it and believe it in your heart, God says that if you ask and do not doubt in your heart, if you believe, then these things will be given to you. If you truly believe that, I say you're in good hands. Lord God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this morning. God, for the word that you've given to me so I can speak it to the people. Lord, I thank you for every single one of these people in here. God, I pray that they would just be reminded. Reminded of your goodness. Reminded of how great you are. Reminded of all the things that you've done, if not in their lives, but in the lives of others. 
God, we love you. We want to live a life for you. We want to live a victorious life. We want people to see us and say, man, how are they so different? How can they just lose a lost, a, a, a loved one and be this joyful, be this happy, not be crushed? How can they rejoice when the bank forecloses their house? How can they be happy in this time? What is it about them? Lord, I believe that you're going to remind them this week, that you're, going to rem- that you're going to bring to their memory all these things, Father. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to do one more worship song before we go into offering. And I encourage you just to, to stand and to praise God, to glorify God. Be thankful for everything that he's done in your life. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you were blessed by this broadcast. If you need prayer, there are several ways to contact us. You can message us on our Instagram or on Facebook at deeprooted.mi. You can also visit our website to fill out a connect form at deeprootedministries.com slash connect. If you were blessed by today's teaching, we encourage you to support our ministry so we can reach even more people. Giving options are available to you online at deeprootedministries.com slash give. Be blessed today, continue living in the victory, and remember that you are always welcome here in our family of faith.